need a guide to show you how we get through a situation like this, to give you resources and to help you get out of the emotional pea soup fog of dealing with a crisis and the resulting fallout. I've been there and I'm here to help you. Read a copy of my Boots formula in the new book, Bootstraps and Bra Straps, the formula to go from rock bottom back into action. Bootstraps and Bra Straps book is on Amazon, Audible, and Kindle. Are you ready for a reboot? Welcome to the Sheila Mack Show, reality at its finest. History reminds us those hit hardest often become the change makers. This year, we've all hit crazy economic, social, and emotional rock bottoms. We all get knocked down. Something hits globally, locally, personally. It affects our health, finances, our relationships. We have to recreate a business or career. Each show, Sheila and her special guest will be sharing their reboot stories, guiding you with real solutions to upgrade and up-level emotionally, mentally, physically, spiritually, and financially. Here on NBC's KCAA Radio, if you're ready to pull yourself up by the bootstraps and bra straps, enjoy a listen. Here's Sheila. Welcome to the Sheila Mack Show, reality at its finest. Here we have real people sharing real stories and actionable steps to help you reinvent, rebuild, and reboot your business and personal life on your terms. I'm your host, Sheila Mack, and today we have a special guest, Devin Miller. A bit more about Devin. Devin loves startups. He runs his own patent and trademark law firm to help startups and small businesses. He also founded his first startup while learning and earning his law and MBA degree for a total of four degrees. Since then, he has founded several seven and eight figure startups and enjoyed every minute of it. Lots of information to share today. Thank you for being on the show, Devin. Absolutely. I'm excited to be here. All right. And now this show is actually based on my new best-selling book, uh, Bootstraps and Bra Straps. There it is. Uh, the formula to go from rock bottom back into action in any situation. And over the last couple of years, we've had more situations than we could ever imagine before that. Uh, so I'd love for you to share about a time in your business or personal life where you experienced a tough situation and how you got back on track. Yeah, um, probably the one that at least comes to mind as far as a tough situation, which is probably a bit ironic since I'm an attorney, but was uh, one of the, the times I was sued with one of my businesses personally. And so, um, you know, it was at least in, in my my opinion, it was a frivolous lawsuit. It was someone that was trying to leverage us as we were uh, looking to uh, make some or to uh, merge a couple of businesses, and they figured, hey, why don't we file this, make it make it difficult for them, and then um, they'll go ahead and uh, you know pay us some money to go away. We obviously didn't want to pay, and I didn't want to pay, and so it was about a, a year of my life where we went back and forth. We um, went to you know negotiations went to remediation and everything else and at the end of the day after about a year of back and forth the it was inter what it was interesting and what worked out well although i wouldn't well, i wish i could uh, forget that year of my life was that we ended up uh, buying that business out and so we are basically for pennies on the dollar the business they weren't able to sustain it and so when the when the dust settled we we bought the business out we were able to incorporate that in with the deal that we were already working on and even get a better evaluation but at the time of going back and forth trying to work a deal trying to keep that going and also uh, work to avoid the, the legal issues was one that was a, a certainly a, a less than desirable point in life yes yes that lag it's like this lag time and you're you're losing money in a legal situation or some kind of situation and even though you you turn out to have won, you still lose money and time and stress. Uh, <laughs> yep, yeah, I've I've been in that a few different times with different minor things or weird things that happened, and and it's always a learning experience. And I think that's one of the most important reasons why you have your business protections set up right away uh, when you start a business. So uh, that's something I've had many businesses and always, I don't know, I guess I was afraid to have a problem. So I went ahead and did everything you're supposed to do. <laughs> and it really did help. It really did help. So uh, for those that are tuning in and starting a business or have a business and are concerned about, you know, is my business protected against crazy things like this? What sure. can they do? How should they start? 
Yeah, I mean, I, I would back up and what I would look at is people always want a guarantee. They want to know, hey, if I do the, you know, step one, two, and three, I want my business to be 100%. So nobody can ever sue me. I'll never have any legal issues. It'll just be wonderful. That's not a realistic goal. In other words, doesn't matter how much you work to protect it, what you do, there's always a possibility of getting sued. It can be a frivolous lawsuit like we experienced. It can be a legitimate lawsuit or it can be somewhere in between. And so when you're looking to get protection, it's more of, hey, we're looking to build as strong of a layers of protection, as much defense as we can, so that if or when that comes to pass, that we're able to be in the best situation to deal with it or to otherwise or fight with or fight against it. And so, you know, a few things that come to mind is one of the things I would always recommend as people get started is that they get a business formation in place. That can be an LLC. Those are less expensive, easier to do. If you're a little bit more sophisticated, you can do an S Corp or a C Corp. That's a lot of time to do with taxes and also a little bit of if you're looking to bring on investors. That's always a, what, the best place you start. And the reason you start there is because it gives you defense against personal liability. In other words, if people are, you know, if you were to get sued, somebody to get mad, file a lawsuit or otherwise come after you, they can come after the business, but they can't come after your house, your life savings, your car or anything else. And it gives you that layer of protection. The other thing I'd always get is insurance. You know, mm -hmm. people oftentimes, you know, you think about you have car insurance, you have homeowners insurance, and then you never really think about business insurance. Like, oh, I'll be fine. I'm not going to worry about it. And yet it's great to have that as a, kind of that second layer. So first layer is to get a business form. Second layer is to get that insurance in place. And then with that, then you're starting to look and say, okay, I need to figure out the layers of protection that are specific to my business. So those are both pretty general. Basically, mm -hmm. I'd recommend it for every business. But then you're saying, okay, what type of business are you? Are you a invention business? Are you making great products that are really catchy, that are innovative, that are different? And that's where the core of your business is. Are you doing a brand where you're really good at marketing and sales and otherwise telling a story and building a brand? Are you really good at content? You know, you can do movies, you can do videos, or you can do blogs, or you can do podcasts or whatever that might be. And depending on where you're building that value of the business, you're going to look at one or more of patents, trademarks, and copyrights because all of those provide different protections depending on your business. Yes, yes. And, you know, it's some of it doesn't really cost as much as you might think. And that's that's one thing that I found out. I thought, oh, my gosh, you know, I've already put in so much to start. But like my first store at 23, I put in all this money just to get started and you know, when you're that young, it's like all the money you have. And so uh, with that, I actually, it wasn't too bad. It was much less than it is now to do the S. I did the S Corp in California. I think it's like $800 now, but it was probably maybe 400 back then. That's a long time ago. <laughs> I don't know, but, but it wasn't too bad and it was worth it. And then the insurance um, route was, you know, we had, um, I had already, I already had rental property. So for mm. me, I had my everything put into um, an LLC in the properties. I had the S Corp for the business, which I don't know if it was probably too much, but that's what I did. And then I had um, my regular insurance and then an umbrella policy mm. is really good to have uh, that kind of covers above and beyond. I think it was a million back then. Now I think you can get three to five million or something like that in, in the umbrellas. So that was something I did. And I luckily I didn't really have a problem, but I do remember <laughs> when I finally closed my stores and went to online only and then mm -hmm. rented the buildings out. It was the last day. And and I have these great young people that were working for me that were coming out of foster care and then emancipating and they went through this training program. Anyway, this lady comes in and every time she came in, she's a great little client but she would come in and she would tell about she'd have a cast or something on her <laughs> neck and she'd say I fell at this store or I fell at the shopping you know the the grocery store and I got so much money and <laughs> I'm going shopping and so she came in and she was my last customer <laughs> and my kids were like we're gonna walk with her and if she tries to fall we'll catch her <laughs> Because she kept, she would brag about, so, you know, and I don't know. I mean, who knows? Maybe she really did fall and she was happy she won. I don't know. But it was, it was like a few times in different places. So it was kind of, kind of like suspicious. And, and that was, that was quite a memory. I was like, oh my gosh, this is crazy. Our last customer, what is this about? So, and then we were so happy. She bought a whole bunch of things. 
on sale and she was happy and you know thanked us and left no problem didn't try anything but but it was that you know that knowing okay but at least i've got insurance just in case the kids don't catch her <laughs> so it was it was interesting so you there are people that actually are professional professionals at just doing that uh, yeah and i think that you know First of all, yeah, for people there there are people that are professional to slipping and falling and otherwise getting injured. But even if I were to say there are people that are, are professional, now there are people that whether it's coming to your business and let's say you get you know a smash and grab and, and people come and grab your stuff, somebody gets injured, somebody feels that you uh, you know infringe your, their trademark or you are ripping off their idea or, or you you know you have an employee that leaves a business and they think that they are owed something because they are wrongly determined. I mean, there are just uh, so many things that could go wrong that it's just much easier. And usually insurance works for most businesses and most industries that they're going to look at, depending on the size of the business, they're going to look at the industry as far as the likelihood of, you know, having any issues and, you know, legal industry versus the real estate industry versus mm -hmm. the restaurant industry. And they're going to look at the number of employees and revenue. And if you're starting out, they'll usually say, as long as you're not in a very high risk area, you're going to have it to be a reasonably or a, a low cost to you, but it adds a lot of layer of protection such that as long as you don't do anything fraudulent and wrong on your end in the sense that you're not trying to hide things, you're doing something illegal, it gives you a much la better layer of protection to add on top of what you're already doing. Yeah, it just makes sense. And in all the years with property investing, I only had one claim and it was a two-story townhouse. The tenants went on vacation and the other, the other townhome, because I had like three townhomes in a row, um, the other townhome tenant called and said, there's water flowing out of the back house. And mm -hmm. it was, it was, I guess, over 50,000 in damages. Like the water had, gone, it was a toilet valve upstairs, some kind of pressure valve thing. I don't even know what exactly it was that happened, but it just kind of exploded. Nobody was home. Nobody did it. And I was so grateful because everything was covered. Rents were covered. You know, the tenant got to move and have everything taken care of. Everything was paid for by the insurance. And I was like, oh, wow, that was worth it. Oh, my goodness. I would have been really up the creek for sure <laughs> with all that water damage. So it was it was a gift to have and uh, made a big difference for us. So those are little things. Now, do you have any... Um, advice if somebody's starting out and they're like oh my gosh this is there's so many fees and things mm. to do what what is the minimum to start um yeah i mean it is always as a startup in a small business you're always going to have more things to spend money on than money to spend it's just <laughs> yeah. kind of the, the status of life that, of that part that you're going to be in and, and you might as well embrace it because there's you know it's just part of how you do it and so it's always a matter of, of balancing. In other words, if you're going in and you have zero dollars and you have a good idea, go ahead and put in a whole bunch of blood, sweat, and tears. I wouldn't worry about the business formation. Or I probably would, in a sense. I would probably go do. We do it as we have a, a fairly automated DIY system. There are others out there like LegalZoom. I would still, unless you have zero dollars, go form the business. You can do it for uh, usually a couple hundred dollars. That one's pretty expensive. If you don't have any money whatsoever, then I would just go ahead and start building the business, putting in that sweat equity, getting it to a point that you can actually make money off of. But usually if you're going to start a business, scrape together a little bit. I would at least get the business formed and give you that layer of protection. But beyond that, even before I would get the business going, I would say there's one step before that, which is you need to validate a bit of the business. In other words, you need to actually see, is this a business that I want to go and invest in? Right. So some of the things that I, you know, we work with a lot of startups and small businesses with my or with my intellectual property law firm. And we will have businesses that come in and say, I've got this great idea. It's going to be a multi-billion. And that's usually how it begins. I always, you always know if somebody is comes in and they have this great idea and it's going to be a billion dollar business, they're not going to be a client because they have done zero amount of work to actually figure mm -hmm. out the marketplace. And so when you're, if to not be that individual that just has the idea that will never go anywhere, Go out and do a bit of research. As simple as it sounds, a lot of people don't go Google it. They just think, well, I've never seen it. I've never actually encountered it. It's got to be innovative and new. And then you go and spend a few minutes, do you some research, and you find out it's new. So I would always start doing a bit of research. I'll even go one step before that. And I feel like I'm going backwards, and usually I should go forwards. Um, 
But the one I would even do that I recommend for all the businesses we start out is if you're in that idea stage, if you're like me, I have I, you know, 10 ideas before I get into work, another 20 throughout the day and another 10 before I go to bed. And I have 40 ideas. 99% of them are really bad ideas that I should never invest any more time and money and effort into. But there's always that 1% and every so often I'll have an idea that makes sense. But what but it's hard to know when you're having those ideas, whether or not they're good ideas, because you had them, they seem exciting to you and you want to get going on them and you start to kind of go all over and try and chase a whole bunch of ideas when most of them aren't are worthwhile to pursue. So my rule of thumb that I always tell others is if you have an idea that you think is worthwhile, write it down on a sticky note, put it on your desk, give it seven days, wait one week, see if when you come back and you read that idea on the sticky note, if you're still as excited, still think it's a good idea. That's the best first step to start out with because most of the time you're going to look, I look at the idea and I say, you know, that's really not a very good idea. I really don't think it's worthwhile to pursue. And I usually crumple up the sticky note, throw it away. But the ones that make it pass, then I do the due diligence, go do research. If it's still worthwhile after I do the research, then I form the LLC. After I form the LLC, then you start to actually have to figure out how are we going to build this? How are we going to bootstrap it? And what are, or where are we going to take it? Which is a much longer part of the process. Yes. Now that's something um, it, you've, you've received four different degrees. So you were in it for the long haul, going through school alone is, is part of the deal. And that's the thing about new businesses also is it takes like a year for people to even know. And these are like your circle of influence, your friends, your family, your neighbors that are like, oh, is that what you're doing now? You're in this business? Oh, you have, you know, have a book out, you have this and that. They don't know. And, and so it takes time, marketing dollars and effort. And you think, what do you mean you don't know? You're like my best friend. <laughs> and it's six months into it. They're like, yeah, I do. you barely figured it out. So, and they want to know that you're for, for real, that you're really in it. Also, mm -hmm. like, they're like, oh, that's nice. That's cute, honey. You're doing X, Y, Z. But they want to know that you're invested in it also. So they'll watch for the long game for a good six months to a year before they're like, okay, you know what, she, you know, he or she is doing this and, and look at their success. The clients have results. I'm going to go ahead and sign up now. So that's what it takes. So if you back out before that first year, you haven't even started. Yeah. I mean, I think that, you know, the difficulty with that most people encounter is that you read the book, you see the movie, you watch the television show, you go watch, and I love Shark Tank, you go watch Shark Tank, <laughs> yeah. you go watch The Prophet, or you read the book about, and it always feels like everybody's an overnight success. They have the idea, they put it out there magically, m money rains from the sky and it's great. And then you get into the business, you're saying, "My, it doesn't feel like that's how it's happening for me. This is a lot harder and this is taking a lot more. What's wrong with me? And the, the honest answer is, Every business is 10 years, you know, an overnight success, 10 years in the making. And that can be 10 years of getting the skills in place that you need in order to make this business a success. It can be 10 years of building the business. It can be 10 years of doing that. But there's always a much longer journey ahead of that than most people you never see. They always want to jump in the movie or the show to the success and jump over all the hearts part because that's mm -hmm. not exciting. And yet you've got to say, You've got to give it a bit of time to maturate, to mature, and to otherwise, um, you know, become an actual business. And to your point, that's not going to happen for probably a year or a lot of times even longer than that, depending on the type of business. Yes. I mean, I had my physical gift stores for 17 years. We ended up with five and then transitioned to some online stores and rented the properties out, which I purchased. But one of the questions Tony Robbins asks in Business Mastery is, what business are you in? And what business are you really in? So somehow for me along the line, I went from a store owner, operator to owner, to then a business owner and investor in property with passive income. And it was like, oh, I didn't even know that was the business I was really in. I had like, I did everything kind of backwards. I got my degrees after I was consulting other retail store owners on how to buy buildings and do things, exit strategies. I didn't even know, I didn't call it consulting. No, I and, I, and I like, you know, one of the hard things is, is you, you also hear, you need to have a business plan. And I, I think that to a degree, a business plan is yeah. right. In other words, they're saying, hey, you need to put it on paper, get the plan out. I agree, but the reason that you typically do a business plan is less so because that's what the business is going to turn out to be. It's more so on the front end, you're doing enough of the work to convince yourself this is worthwhile to put all your blood, sweat, money, and tears into it. 
And then you're going to get down the road and almost every business is going to have to do some sort of a pivot adjustment, go in a different direction as you're figuring out what do you enjoy? Where are you passionate? Where is the market? Who are your customers? How much can you charge? Uh, you know, is the what does the market want? Where is the opportunity? Who's a competitor? I mean, you go through all that list and where you look back, you're going to say, this is a different business than I intended to do. So I think you have to be willing to pivot and adjust. But you also need to do that work on the front end so that you know that it's worthwhile as you're going through the process that, no, I did convince myself this is worthwhile to pursue and it's still a good opportunity. Yes, very much so. So now going back to your schooling, what advice do you have for listeners that are either parents of college students or college students themselves, or maybe they've gone back for a degree because of all this crazy COVID stuff and they need to like reinvent their careers. What advice would you give for someone in that realm? Yeah. And I'll correct one thing you said, and I, I feel like I have to circle back. So I didn't go my education alone for most of it. I was married and my wife was a great support and she was always there for me. So I always had to feel like I give her, she, she earned degrees, degrees almost as much as I did because she had to put up with all the years of media or doing schools and never being available and always studying. So now going to your actual question is, you know, for me, the, the probably, so I, I, I went and got different degrees, you know, four different degrees. They're all kind of covering different areas. And for me, the mantra is one is I always figured if I was going to go get an education, I might as well get as much while I'm at school doing that. I might as well get as much as I can. So yes. both of those degrees were dual degrees. At the same time I was studying one, I was going to get the other. I was going to pack in as much as I could mm -hmm. while I was getting school. So I always now don't go over. Don't overwhelm yourself. Don't try to do too much, but look for opportunities, whether it's that second degree, whether it's getting the internship or work experience or other things to use, utilize that time while you, while you have it, because when you're in school, it is a great time to experiment and try things out in the sense of the business and utilizing your degree because you have much more of a safety net. Once you get out in the working field or working world, you have rent, you have all the obligations. If you're married, you have a spouse, you might have kids and all those things on those obligations make it more difficult, certainly not impossible, but to pursue a lot of different things that you may be interested in. In school, you have a lot more of that safety net. You're going through the education, you're paying that, you might have student loans or scholarships or otherwise doing it, but it makes it a lot easier. The other thing that I always hit on is it, a lot of times with the educational system, at least my perspective, is they tend to want to put you in a box. In other words, they're saying you are studying this and this is what you are studying. Right. And so for me, it was, you know, as an example, I got to the end of undergraduate and I liked engineering, but I didn't want to be an engineer. So I was trying to figure out what I wanted to be when I grow up. And I kind of had two passions. I love startups. I love small businesses. I loved entrepreneurship. And I also found the law very interesting. And it mm -hmm. felt like, you know, most of the time I tell people, so choose one or the other. Like, you know, yeah. go be a lawyer. They can be successful or go run your business. That can be successful. And even when I would go talk with a lot of the, the people that were running the programs, like to do dual degrees, they're like, how many people get MBAs and law degrees at the same time? Why don't you just choose one or the other? Those are both, you know, hard programs. You're gonna, and I felt like it was kind of boxing you in. Right. And yet, once you say no, I I can choose my direction. I just said I'm not gonna choose one or the other. I'm gonna do legal. I'm gonna do entrepreneurship. I'm going right down the middle and doing both. It opened up a lot of possibilities to where I it makes it so that I can mix in within my career the things that I love and enjoy. So one, I would say pack in as much as you can, but don't overwhelm yourself. But then two is don't allow others to put you in a box of this is what you have to do with your degree or with your career. Figure out what excites you and what people are willing to pay you for and then go go, go get those skills. Right. And I think that I, I guess when you're younger, especially, you don't even know what that is, but it'll start to show up. It'll keep coming out. So mm -hmm. for me, uh, first degree was um, computer programming for money, working at JPL. I hated it. 18 years old, working in the engineering, like you, engineering, engineering department with all these incredible engineers. I was doing it for the money. And then they gave me the opportunity of leading the safety OSHA training because it was boring and nobody wanted to do it. And I made people smile and laugh. Mm -hmm. And I was like, oh, yes, I could do this day and night. This is awesome. I mean, there's, back then it was 10,000 employees there in the Pasadena JPL. And, and I loved that. And then it was leading a team at work at the store. And so really that's, that's like my working with people. Great. Putting me in front of a computer all day. 
I mean, it's, it's, it's like, oh my gosh, it's not my thing. It's torment, torture. And I can do it really well. Mm -hmm. I just don't really like it. And it's not my best thing. So there's lots of things we can do well. And then there's something that gives you the passion to jump out of bed and be like, okay, yes, I'm going to help some people today. I'm going to make a difference. I feel good about this. And when you go to bed, you're like, yeah, I had a good day. I did these things. And that's, that's something. I'm, I'm absolutely agree. Now, I'll caveat it with the one thing I see on the other extreme, which is, you know, the common mantra within, you know, the, the it seems like a lot of the, uh, or the public is just follow your passion, follow your dream. And I think that that's half right in the sense that you should find something you're passionate about, but you have to find something that people are willing to pay you for. In other words, I can be as passionate as I want about being the best basketball player. I am never going to the NBA. Now I may I may find something else. I may love statistics and I may go and do something with statistics with the NBA, or I may go and find collectibles and memorabilia, or I may go to something else. And so you have to figure out what your passion is. But then you have to figure out what people are paying you for, or willing to pay you for. And if you can then marry the, marry those things together, then you have something that you know that you're going to be excited about, you're going to be passionate about, and good at, and that uh, is also you're going to be able to make a living at. Mm-hmm. Yes. Yes. And that is that is something that having these different talents and being able to use them is fun. So when you start getting into passive income and investing and buying properties and all these different things that I somehow did, oh my, that was art. That was my art expression. I could go, I could walk into a building and be like, I can make this earn 40% more income. I will take it. You know, I got the ROI. I, I can do it in my head. And, mm -hmm. and I'm not that good at math, except for when it comes to money. I, <laughs> like, like I literally, when I got my, my I guess my, the bachelor's, when they require the general eds to pass mm -hmm. math. And it was, it was not my thing. I got my programming degree because I never took the math test. <laughs> it was like really crazy. But to, to do that, the prof I went to the tutoring center. And as soon as they said it in money, I like got it. And I was like, got it. And they thought it was the craziest thing because that's what I knew working. You know, this I came from foster care, homeless as a kid, graduating and emancipating at 15 and going on my own. So I knew how to survive and pay the bills. So sometimes we use our passions no matter what we're doing. It doesn't mean that there's times in life you're going to have to roll up your sleeves and you're like, I don't really like this. I have to paint the building myself because like I have barely enough to invest in this. I had to do all this hard work and I don't know how to do it. And I'm learning and it's not fun, but it's, it's just, I love it. And I think that's a great takeaway for people is that, you know, it's not, it's not fun. It, just because you're doing what you love doesn't mean it's going to be fun every day or every <laughs> task you do, is going to be fun. I love what I do. I am very passionate about it. It's I find it to be a blast. There are days that I don't want to go to work or that I'm tired of dealing with all the employees or everybody else's problems. And I just want to do what I want to do. And yet you have to get it done. So I think that you have to realize, even if you find that passion needs skill set, doesn't mean every day is going to be fun, but a whole bunch of them are. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It goes back to that 10 years for a success. And, yep. and people think, oh, well, you just got lucky. Like, you know how many hours... <laughs> you know, and then you're like, hours of failure and having to figure it. things out. It took me to get lucky. Yeah. You know how many times I fell and had to go from that rock bottom back and how I had to get up again and again when I didn't want to, and nobody believed in me. Okay. Let's talk about that for a minute. Yeah. So that, that is something that you get to learn with experience or you don't have a business in the end. Absolutely. You quit. <laughs> yeah. So I wonder how does, COVID and this interesting time with this pandemic, how does that affect your, um, have you noticed different, more business startups, less, what's with the business law? How's that going? So I would say it, it feels like it's always pivoting and adjusting. So you would have taken, 2020 was a great year for startups. And the reason being, and you would think, well, why is 2020? You've got pandemics, you got lockdowns and everything else. Well, there's a couple things that are were beneficial for starting up. One is that, People weren't having to commute as much because they're typically working from home. They're oftentimes locked down and they may not be working at all. And uh, they have more time, free time on their hands because they're not going out as much. And then you put that with a lot of the, whether it's whatever political side of the aisle, but you had government bailouts, you had more people or 
money flowing into businesses. So all of that combination, I think, actually helped with a lot of people saying, hey, I'm either going to do this as a side hustle or I'm going to do this as a full time gig. And they actually started to make the leap away from just working with for others and doing it for themselves. So 2020 was a good year. Now you fast forward to probably mid 2021. You're almost seeing a bit of the opposite effect now as you're getting a lot of those programs are tapering off. You're seeing that there's a supply chain issues. You're seeing inflation. In other words, people are getting nervous and kind of saying the opposite of, oh, my gosh, was this a good idea? Should I do a startup and should I, you know, should I go forward and do this? And so you're seeing kind of the other side of that curve where it's going up for a while. Now it's kind of tapering down as people are trying to figure out, is was this a good idea? And mm. for me, you know, the one takeaway I would give is there is there's never an opportune time to start a business and there's always a great time. But, you know, one thing I love about with and not, not saying I love COVID, but the thing that COVID did and anytime there's chaos, anytime there's shaking up in the marketplace that creates something that people are no longer doing the status quo, that aren't they aren't just doing it how they've always done, it always presents an opportunity. In other words, it's kind of the chinks in, or chink in the armor. You know, in other words, you see the chinks in the armor, the weaknesses of other businesses, the things they aren't doing well, opportunities they aren't taking care of or taking advantage of. And you wouldn't normally see that when everything is status quo and everybody's doing well because you're focusing on doing well. But you, it presents a lot of opportunities if you're keeping your eye out for it, which is what I see with a lot of the businesses and the startups and that that are succeeding. Is there one they got going because of COVID maybe, but two, they're now saying, hey, we can continue to navigate this because as the chaos continues, if we can navigate it successfully, we can or we can outperform others that aren't. Yes. Yeah, you know, for me, I thought I was going on a book tour. My book had just come out and I was like, what a pandemic, no book to lockdowns. Are you serious? Like my whole goal, everything that you're supposed to do to, you know, share and market about your book gone. And I was like, oh, this is awesome. And I had moved my main residence to a place that is kind of in nature. It's beautiful. It's lovely. Newer homes. Great the internet was so bad that I had to rent an office just to do this show, just to like get online and do my courses and different things I was creating. And so I was spending a bunch of money <laughs> on renting offices that, that was not an expense I wanted to have. It was like another mortgage. It was ridiculous. And, and finally, about a year later, we got real internet. And it's like, oh, you have no idea how happy and I'm saving all this money, not having to. And I loved the office. It was the most beautiful office on the planet. And they built me a beautiful studio. It was great. But it, the expense I could do without. So so it was all these curveballs and how to how to, I don't know, be resilient and really creative. Creativity was it like, how am I going to do this? I have, I don't even have internet and we can't even go anywhere because places are closed. So I, luckily I had a, a close business that actually was allowed to let us in during the lockdowns to do that. So it was a lot of negotiating to get that opportunity. <laughs> yeah. So, so now um, we are coming closer to the end of our talking time. I'd love for you to share um, how, where, where do you help people? Is it all over the United States? How exactly does that work? If somebody wants to you know, do a check-in with you and see where their business is at for protections. How does that work? Yeah, so um, definitely. Uh, we do, we help uh, businesses all over the U.S. So the thing that I love, which makes it nice for the business I'm in, is for patents, trademark, copyrights, intellectual property, um, it's all on the federal level, which allows us to operate in all 50 states because it's non, it's not state-specific law, it's federal law. And so we have, you know, clients, we're headquartered out of uh, Utah, north of Salt Lake City, but I have more, we have more clients than outside of Utah than inside of Utah. So we have clients everywhere from California to New York, from Alaska to Hawaii. We have them in Utah. We have them in Colorado. We have them in Oregon and Washington and everything else. And which makes it really nice because then it's, it allows us to help the startups and small businesses wherever they're located in the U.S. The other thing we've done is we've set it up very well that, while we always are happy to have people in the office, we set it up that they don't have to come into the office to get the same level of service. So we wanted to make sure as we're servicing startups and small businesses that it was available and applicable to everyone, no matter where you're located, and that we have a good and robust system to make sure we help them out. 
Um, as far as if they, if people want to, if they have interest, in, you know, they have a patent, they have a trademark, they have something they need help with, they want to just pick my brain, or they otherwise want to reach out, I'll offer a couple ways to, to get in, in contact with me. So on the intellectual property side with the law firm, if they want to schedule a one-on-one -on -one, uh, meeting with me, answer questions, get them taken care of, make sure that they know what they're doing, they can go to strategymeeting.com. It links right to my calendar, let you grab some time. Anytime that's available on my calendar is available or on the website, it's available on my calendar. I'm happy to chat. Um, if they want to just find the website in general, they just want to reach out and see, hey, what does this guy do? What are the, what are his prices? What are, you know, what are the services? They can go to lawwithmiller.com, which takes us to the general website. The last one is I'm not very active on most socials. I just don't love social media for most aspects, but I do love LinkedIn and this one area where I tend to be fairly active. If they want to check out my profile, just go to meetmiller.com and that will take you right to my LinkedIn profile. So strategy meeting, one-on-one, -on -one, go to strategymeeting.com. They want to check me out on LinkedIn, go to uh, meetmiller.com. All right. Outstanding. Well, thank you again, Devin, for being a special guest on the show. And for those tuning in, we'll be back after these messages. Stay tuned. Tahibo Tea Club's original Pure Pau Arco Super Tea helps you build the red corpuscles in the blood, which can carry oxygen to our organs and cells. Our organs and cells need oxygen to regenerate themselves. The immune system needs oxygen to develop, and cancer dies in oxygen. So the tea is great for healthy people, and it can truly be miraculous for someone fighting a potentially life-threatening disease due to an infection, diabetes, or cancer. A one-pound package of tea is $34.95 plus shipping. To order, please visit lovemysupertea.com. That's love, L-O-V-E, my, M-Y, super, S-U-P-E-R, T, T-E-A, dot com. So the complete website is lovemysupertea.com or call 818-288-4128, Monday through Saturday, 9 to 5, California time. That's lovemysupertea.com at 818-288-4128. It's the holidays, and I'm dealing with an overwhelming sense of grief that is secondary to the loss of my family members that occurred during the holiday season almost two years ago. I'm attempting to resume my family traditions with a smile on my face, but my heart is troubled and sad. I'm grateful for the numerous friends and my support network that I am blessed with. However, I'm hoping that you can offer some insight and suggestions to help me keep my healing heart in perpetual motion this time of year. Thank you. Sincerely, Blue Christmas. Dear Blue Christmas, I'm so sorry for your loss. Losing more than one family member during the holidays is very difficult. I can't imagine. Um, and one of the things that has helped me get through holiday seasons because I've lost quite a few family members myself was to change my my holiday celebrations to celebrate my loved ones that have crossed over in a different way gave me a new tradition and that that may help you as well I'm not sure how you celebrate your holidays or how you did in the past but save a place for them at the table, maybe have a ceremony for them and send them love, and then stop and pause for a moment before you plan your holidays this season and think about what, if they were living with you today, now, what would they want for you as, as, your, as your relative? What would they want to see for your happiest holiday this year? Uh, for myself, with my children, I think, what I would want for my children is to, for them to continue to celebrate and live their best life every day, including on the holidays. And I would appreciate their memories and, and thoughts of me. So I think that may help. And just forming new, new traditions. Because whenever there is a life shift, whatever it is, divorce, um, our kids grow up and they have their own family units, they can't travel to see us, whatever it is, our holidays are going to shift over time and and grieving a loved loss of more than one loved one is the hardest um, for sure yet these are things that that are going to happen and so to have a new form of holiday will, will make a big difference for you i hope this helps
As always, I wish you life, love, laughter, and light. Your host, Sheila Mack. And I wanted to take a moment to reflect on one of my favorite authors and quotes. The quote is, Create a definite plan for carrying out your desire and begin at once, whether you're ready or not, to put this plan into action. And the author was Napoleon Hill. A little bit about what I do is I help people to reinvent, rebuild, and reboot their business and personal life on their terms. And so I do consulting, I I have a book out, and I also have a radio and TV show. Holiday rules and traditions. So I raised three incredible children and then adopted three more. So this family of six diverse children, it, it was wonderful. And our holidays went well. For many years, we had the big Thanksgiving meal that everybody else has. And while we had elders that were still living and family and friends that were older that that didn't have anywhere to go, we always had a big Thanksgiving, traditional Thanksgiving meal. And then we realized one day uh, we had these family group discussions and all the kids voted out the Thanksgiving meal. And... I was like, what are you talking about? And they were like, well, you know what? We want our mom. We don't want you to cook for four days straight. (laughs) And we don't, we don't, we don't even like turkey and we don't like the stuffing and we don't like the bread. We don't like any of that food. And, and it was just this funny thing that we had. And, you know, a lot of our loved ones have, have passed on, crossed over that were the parent elders, the grandparents who we entertained. And so then it was our own private Thanksgiving again. And we changed our traditions. We changed our traditions based on the fact that I didn't even, I didn't want to eat the food because I'm always on this wellness kick trying to get in shape or whatever. And the kids didn't want to eat the food. I was like, okay, why am I spending money and time on food that nobody really wants? And it's obligatory. It's like it's obligation that we have to do this traditional thing because that's what you do. Guess what? You don't have to do that. You can create your own traditions for your family based on your terms. It is morally neutral, whether you serve turkey or not, or whether you have a big meal or maybe you have a healthy meal and go do something fun. So we have different traditions now. We watch certain movies that we all choose and we have fun meals, <laughs> but, but it's really not about the food. It's about the time together as a family for us and everybody's Thanksgiving wishes or holiday celebrations new families, guess what? Create it on your terms. Make it so that your family, you and your family enjoy the food, enjoy the the people around you at that table and enjoy this time, this time of gratitude and thanksgiving. We can make it what we want as a family or as a single person. Let this be your choice. This is your holiday, not based on these rules. If you are just tuning in, this is NBC Sheila Mack Show here on KCAA Radio, the station that leaves no listener behind. I'm your host, Sheila Mack, and I have some news for you. Yes, you. I'm celebrating my third year now on the station and will be expanding the show to a global network as well. You may now find The Sheila Mack Show on all major podcasting channels. And if you have not subscribed to my YouTube channel, all the episodes are now available for viewing there as well. And I'm asking you for a quick favor. If you like the show, please help support the spread of this reboot channel on YouTube as well. My goal is to help as many people as possible through our interesting times to rebuild, reinvent, and reboot your business and personal life. I also wanted to share a little bit more about how I got here, what I do now, and how designing a business career and life on your terms 
is more than possible at any age or stage in life. I am an enterprisingly forward thinking consultant, show host, and best selling author. But how did I get here? Well, I began my career as an entrepreneur and property investment strategist back when I was 23 years young, when I boldly quit my government job with NASA JPL to open my first of five large gift stores while also starting to invest in property. I got to work with some of the world's most loved companies, such as negotiations on leases with Warner Brothers and winning trips to London as the top selling Crabtree and Evelyn provider in the US for multiple years. My stores were built on heart as I gave back to the community I came from. So now some of you know this and some of you don't know this, but as a young girl with parents who were not well enough to care for me, I was homeless at age 10, then in foster care, where it was really hard to get a job while in the system. I finally emancipated at the age of 15 to start college early. While running my stores, I worked with a government program. Back then, it was called Job Training Partnership Act, making my stores an open source training site where close to 200 at-risk youth started their careers. Yes, I began my career helping business leaders and working professionals to design a life they love where they can have success in their careers and get to the business of life. See, a funny thing happened along the way. Uh, When I first opened my gift store, it was kind of crazy because I was this young upstart. That's what a lot of the store owners called me. Uh, My first store was in Montrose, California in this sweet little hometown uh, shopping park with other stores and restaurants nearby. And so I was the young upstart that didn't know what she was doing. At least that's what everybody said. And I didn't really care what they said. (laughs) At that age, you know, their opinion was like, I don't really care. So that that was probably a really good thing because I stayed focused on what I needed to do. And I had negotiated uh, to lease out a 5,000 square foot gift store that needed a lot of work. And I, I got free rent and uh, for about six months and I had to start making the rent, which was 5,000 a month, which was a lot of money back then, a dollar a square foot. And so I had to learn and relearn. I, I finally did hire quite, quite soon in the game. I did hire a marketing expert, branding expert, I guess back then. And uh, that lady really helped me to figure things out when I first started. And when you first start a business, especially when you're young, it was like <laughs> I had no idea what to do. But I needed to learn because my rent was going to start coming due every month. And over that time, I started having more success. I did crazy things like stayed open until almost midnight every night, along with the restaurants who were very close to my store, while everybody else closed shop at about 5 or 6 p.m. So I was making more money from the start, and I just really my store was to help my kids and the products I sold was whatever the community wanted. I sold lots of things to people in the entertainment industry. I worked with cruise ships. I worked with many different people in the community. And later on, the store owners actually came to me and asked me if I would consult them and help them. I actually started buying my other buildings because I didn't like the idea of paying rent for years and years and years and not building equity. So I did get my real estate license uh, through that and invested and bought my other four store buildings. And uh, lots of the other store owners worked with me, paid me (laughs) to consult and help them do what I was doing. And I didn't really even know it was called consulting. I just knew how to figure it out, I guess. And so that's how I started my career. And now 
you know, I raised six children, all that, and now they're grown. And so I get to come to work every day and do what I naturally do best as an entre enterprising and forward thinking business leader. Through my show, courses, and live events, I guide entrepreneurs and working professionals like you through the profitable steps of building a business, creation to expansion, marketing from planning to implementation, wealth preservation through strategic planning and yes, real estate investing, and lifestyle design so that you can earn more while getting back to the business of living your best life. So I do invite you to tune in here uh, to KCAA radio. And also I would really appreciate it if you went to my YouTube channel, Sheila Mack show and gave a subscribe and a listen to some of your favorite shows. And I do have some other exciting things, including a free gift to thank you. So if you go to www.sheilamack.com, that's S-H-E-I-L-A-M-A-C, sheilamack.com, there you can get a free gift to get started on your reboot this year. And now back to the show. All right, I have found something magical, something new that I am loving at this stage in my life. I have been switching to the cleanest, best, healthiest makeup, shampoos, uh, facial products. So I did find a incredible uh, makeup line and they have been around quite some time. It is called Beauty Counter, and if you go to beautycounter.com slash Sheila Mac, S-H-E-I-L-A-M-A-C, or SheilaMac.com, and at the top of the menu, look for Natural Beauty, that will bring you to the site where you can learn about the specials and give clean beauty a try. I am just loving the difference it's making in my face. And one of the things that was really bothering me was a lot of the other products. I, I could not find eye makeup that wasn't irritating. So this is really like one of the few products I can actually wear around my eyes. And so I'm really loving everything. It makes my skin feel really clean and fresh. And so give it a try. Again, SheilaMac.com com slash natural beauty to learn more necessitated you need a guide to show you how we get through a situation like this to give you resources and to help you get out of the emotional pea soup fog of dealing with a crisis and the resulting fallout i've been there and i'm here to help you out of the fog if you weren't emotionally bound up in your situation you would have more clarity. You would be able to see your best options for dealing with whatever comes up. If the version of yourself who has already walked through this rock bottom and come out the other end could go back in time and give you, the you right now, some advice, what would she say? Would she tell you to slow down, to stop rushing, that you don't have to have all the answers today? Would the future you recommend not making any major decisions without reviewing them first, particularly while you're still in the fog? Would she tell you that normal is going to look different for a while, but that you will feel normal again? In case we haven't invented time travel by the time you read this book, I'm here to tell you all of the above. I developed the Boots formula to help you learn to make choices have a life shift and make great things happen based on your individual values and best life vision. A change is going to happen and it's worth it. There is a stage where it feels like everyone in your life is picking at you. Life itself may seem like it's trying its best to stop you from doing whatever you want to do. All you hear is, that's a stupid idea. And that's never going to work. And who do you think you are? 
One of the hardest things for people to do is to realign and possibly walk away from anything and anyone that conflicts with their value systems. But you are going to discover that power within yourself. Through the activities and examples in this book, you will discover your true north and will be able to easily do what is needed to move forward with your life. Anything that hurts you, that doesn't resonate for you, that fights against what you want and believe in, you are going to give it the boot. Once you have turned your rock bottom moment into a positive, beautiful life shift, you can live your life on your terms. Your life will probably look different, but you get to design it this time. You are taking your life back and you are in charge, not anybody else. Sooner than you can imagine, you'll be in the career of your dreams or the relationship you always wanted. Because you are going to learn to develop healthy boundaries. Because you are going to do things differently along the way from here to there. You will begin to attract the people, the job, the place to live, all of the opportunities that align with who you are, your essence, your truth, not anybody else's, or even society's expectations of the way you're supposed to be. Once you have accepted that you are in charge of living your life and you begin to embody living your truth, people are going to see you. They're going to be inspired by you. Then you're going to hear, hey, can you show me how you did that? I want to do it too. When you assess your peer group and up level according to your life purpose and vision, and once you have created a life shift for yourself, whatever that looks like, your life is not just full, it's fulfilled. Not only do you get more and better sleep, you wake up feeling rested and happy. You know that you're doing what you need to do. Yes, Sometimes your heart will call you to leave certain friends or family members in order to find a more aligned peer group. From what I've seen, however, the ones who leave always return to lead their family and friends to success. Because your friends are more in alignment with your beliefs and value system, they support you while also pushing you toward your personal best. Life still involves work, but as a whole, it feels far more effortless. But you don't have to wait for the right person, right job, or right investment opportunity to show up. You can start living now so that every moment as you go forward through the process of recovering from rock bottom and redesigning your life is one more step to being the best version of you. The one who came... All right, if you are looking to reinvent life on your terms, if you are grieving, experiencing financial turmoil, career shifts, relationship problems, parenting, elder care, victims of abuse, breaking free from an addiction, or seeking an overall business and lifestyle redesign, then you may need a reboot. It is not size fits all, just like a pair of boots or a bra. So the formula is designed to help you through any situation. Tune in again right here on KCAA, the station that leaves no listener behind.